Good to see you today. You know, we're going to begin a brand new series today, and we're calling it Unlocking Marriage. It's about unlocking marriage. We're going to talk about marriage. Now, every time I talk about marriage, some of the single people, they say, well, for the month of October, I got to go visit other churches because what pastor has to say doesn't apply to me. And I want to say to you, please don't do that. We need you here. But I'll tell you three reasons, single people, why you need to be here. Number one is you may know somebody who's married that you can help with some of the stuff we're going to talk about. They might come to you and sometimes you say, I don't know what to say. Well, pay attention. And after this month, you'll have something to say to your married friends. Number two is one day you might get married. And this is great premarital counseling for you. It's going to help you, you know, as you decide to choose and get married. And you, you're going to know what to ask and what to do. And then the third reason is even if you don't get married soon, you know, we're going to be talking about skills that are general, can be generalized in all your relationships. We're going to talk about skills that will help you with your mother, your father, your, your brother, your sister, your friends, your relationships at work. So the things we're going to be talking about apply not only to marriage, even though we're going to focus on marriage, they apply to all your relationships. You know, the Bible calls marriage a mystery. Over there in Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 31 and 32, notice what the Apostle Paul writes. He says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. Then he says, this is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. In other words, Paul says marriage, because, uh, you know, the relationship between Christ and the church is described as one that is a marriage. But he describes, Paul describes marriage as a mystery. Mustere in the, in the Greek. And it means something that is hidden, something that is secret, a thing that's not obvious to the understanding. In other words, something that sometimes is difficult to understand, sometimes hard to wrap your mind around it, especially if you want to do it right, especially if you want to be successful. You know, one of the questions that people ask me, and I'm sure you've asked yourself this question, is it possible for two people to so love each other that they would spend their entire lives together? Is it possible for people to be so bonded in their marriage that nothing can separate them except death? Is it possible for people to be married 40, 50, 60 years? And of course, the answer is yes, it is. During our, during our series, we're going to honor those that have been married over 50 years. And you're going to get to meet some of them in one of our services. But here's what Jesus said. Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 6, this is what Jesus said. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. In other words, Jesus said, don't get rid of, don't, don't, don't separate yourself. Once you make a commitment to be married, the desire of God is that nothing would separate you. You know, that you would be together. Because God's ideal for marriage is long, longevity. God's ideal for marriage is harmony, unity, and intimacy. When God designed marriage, that's how he designed it, that it would last a lifetime. And that you would be united, and you would be together, and there would be this wonderful closeness among the spouses. That's the ideal, but it's very difficult to achieve. You know what? A lot of people would say, well, you know, I understand what God says, but that's impossible. So what we see today is today we go from the ideal, and pretty soon marriage becomes an ordeal, and eventually we're looking for a new deal. And then there comes a point when we say, let's make a deal with whoever wants to make a deal with me. That's what we do. And yet God, God's word has a lot to say about marriage, about life. You know, the Bible gives a lot of keys to understanding life, and that includes our marriage. So I want to talk to you during the month of October about unlocking our marriage, un unlocking and understanding what this God's Word says. Now, to unlock marriage, we need some keys. So what I want to do today is I want to give you some keys to a successful marriage. You know what? Saving your marriage before it starts. You know what? Your marriage is never too late to save. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It's never too late to quit and to say, you know what? There's no hope. You know what? There's nothing I can do. You can always turn it around. And I want to talk to you about that today. But let me give you a little bit of statistics. In 1930, in the 1930s, one out of every seven marriages ended in divorce. One out of every seven. In the 1960s, it went to one out of every four. Now, I've got to explain that to you. You know, one of the ways divorce is reported is by the number of marriage licenses that are issued in a particular year and the number of divorces that are granted in that same year. And that's how we get this this figure that I just gave you. So let me give you the latest. In 2017, in the United States, there were 2.2 million marriage licenses issued in all of the 50 states of the United States. 
And there were close to 900 divorces that were issued in that same period. So, so actual divorce rates by number of couples in the United States is very low. This, this is, remember, when we say one out of every two uh, instant divorce, we're talking about how many people got marriage license and how many got divorces. And it's not necessarily the same people. But here's what we do know. Of actual married couples, we know that four out of every 100 couples get a divorce yearly. Four out of every 100 married people in the United States apply for divorce. Let me give you some good news. The good news is that in America right now, divorces are down. They're going down. The rate, the issuing of divorce license is way, way down. And it's going down. It's been going down for the last three, four years. That's a good, that's a good sign. Can you hear a good amen to that? But listen to this. In 2016, a survey showed that 49% of couples married less than two years reported having serious marital problems. Over 50% of young married couples have doubts about whether their marriage will last. In other words, 50% of young couples says, you know what? I don't know if we're going to make it. I don't know if we're going to get through some of the stuff we're going through. Listen to this statistics, which is alarming to me. Less than 20% or one in five of all marriages in the United States are preceded by some kind of premarital counseling. In other words, what that means is that four out of five people who are getting married today don't get any premarital counseling from someone who knows what they're talking about. They won't do it. And the reason they don't do it is that they don't think they need it. You know what amazes me? Couples are willing to pay five to $700 for a DJ to do the reception, but they won't pay a couple hundred dollars to go get some premarital counseling. That's amazing. You know what that means? That means that planning the perfect wedding is more important than planning a successful marriage. A lot of couples today are getting married and they're putting more energy into the wedding and then they're hoping the best for their marriage. This is the trend. I'll fall in love, I'll get married, and then I'll just hope for the best. Hope I didn't make a big mistake. That's the attitude today. That's what we're seeing today like never before. Now, here's the truth. If I can sort of summarize our, our message today and put it in a nutshell, here's the truth. Marriage in a nutshell, marriage is hard work. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. It's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week job that you can never take time off. It's all, you're always got to be on your game. Marriage, that's how tough marriage is. It's very difficult. Amen. You know, most couples that get married believe they got married because they believe that marriage would be a fairy tale. It would solve all their problems. They will live ever, uh, happily ever after. It would be just a wonderful walk in the park. Amen? And yet, all marriages face serious challenges, including yours, including ours. You know, marriages face some very difficult times. So let me give you some keys. And by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just highlight these. And in the coming weeks, I'm going to take some of these and talk in more detail about them. About, so right now, I just want to highlight some, some basic keys that you need to have a successful marriage. And here's the first one. The first one is the ability to communicate your feelings. The ability to communicate your feelings. In other words, communication. One of the keys to marriages is communication. Here's what studies show. Studies show that 85% of all marriage problems include some kind of communication breakdown. Studies show that what's happening today is that couples are not communicating very well. Listen, if you're going to have a successful marriage, you have to communicate. You've got to have good communication skills. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4. Catch this. He said, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. In other words, Paul writes to this church of, of Ephesus, and he tells these Christians, watch your words. Watch the way you talk to each other. You know what? Say only words that will help. Every word that comes out of your mouth should be a gift. Your, your, your words have the power to do a lot of hurt or to do a lot of help. And what Paul tells the congregation, and if it's good for a church, it's good for individuals, it's about watch your words. And by the way, communication in marriage is lots of work. You know, us guys, for the, for the most part, guys communicate in facts and, and women communicate in emotions. Guys communicate in sound bites. Our wives communicate in megabytes. Amen. <laughs> we, women, women talk more. Now, by the way, this is not macho man jargon. I'm not being a macho man. Studies show that women talk more than men. They have more words than men. And they're not happy until they get them all out. Amen. <laughs> One woman that heard that said, you know what? The reason that's true is because I, you know why I have to repeat everything to my husband? Because he doesn't hear the first time. Sister's going to hear a good amen to that. Yeah. All right. But you know, one of the things that causes problems in our marriage 
is when we begin to speak in riddles or we begin to send hidden messages. You know, our wives will often tell their husbands, I shouldn't have to tell you. You should know this by now. You're not that dumb. You're not that stupid, are you? And the answer, ladies, is yes, we are. We're not as bright. <laughs> Spell it out for us. Amen. Speak slow. Actually, if you could write it down. You know what? That we, we just don't get it. And I'll tell you why we don't get it. By the time we get home, our heads are this big from our job. And the last thing we want to do is communicate. So out of courtesy, we'll listen to you. But you know what? It's going in through here, coming out through here. And we're just trying to unwind. I, I, that's not an excuse. That's, that's, that's reality. We just don't get it. Repetition is good for our souls. Guys, can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Repeat it. Don't get mad at us. Just repeat it. Communicate to us. You know, a couple was driving down a country road for several miles and they weren't saying a word. You see, they had had an argument. They had had a heated argument and none of them wanted to concede their position. None of them wanted to give in. And they're passing this barn, you know what, full of animals, full of mules and goats and pigs. And the guy, the husband, sarcastically looks over to his wife and he says, relatives of yours? <laughs> and uh, she said, yes, they're my in-laws. That's what they are. Good communication. <laughs> Amen. That's good communication. Amen. <laughs> but communication, we'll talk more about that in another message. The second key for your, for your marriage is cons uh, an understanding and acceptance of your differences, your gender differences. The second key to a successful marriage is consideration. Be considerate one of another. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 says this, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you perfectly join together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now Paul's writing to a church. The church is Corinth. There was a lot of problems in the church of Corinth. And one of the things Paul tells them is, you guys got to be considerate of each other. You know what? You're not, don't fight. Don't be at odds. You know what? No, no. You have to deal with one another in a positive way. Some of your Bibles use the word, I, it can be considerate toward one another. You know what consideration means? Consideration means not only thinking of yourself. You know, one of the big problems in marriages is that we, we say me. Marriage is not me anymore. It's we. It's us. You know what? And God, consideration is realizing it's not about me. It's about we. It's about us. It's paying attention to your wife, to your husband, to your family. It means treating each other with respect and with care. That's what consideration is. Paul tells them, hey guys, learn to be considerate. Be considerate of each other. And you know why he tells them to learn it? You know why he tells them learn to be considerate? Because by nature, we are very selfish people. Do you know that by nature, we only think of my needs, my hurts, my wants. I think only of me. It's what, what I want. And yet, one of the purposes of marriage... One of the things that God teaches us when we get married is to stop thinking only of yourself. You know what? It's not me. It's we. Marriage forces us to learn consideration. And every time the Bible talks about consideration, it talks about something you got to learn, something you got to accept, something you got to do intentionally, deliberate. Learn to be considerate of one another. You see, God's purpose in marriage is not to make you happy. God's purpose, you know, that's one of the benefits. If you do it right together, you're going to add happiness. But one of the main purposes of marriage is to teach us to stop being so selfish and be considerate and learn how to give and learn how to take. And sometimes there's more giving than taking. You know, consideration is not being selfish. Here's the truth. The truth of the matter is that, you know, the reason we stop being considerate of one another is because we're disappointed in our marriages. We get disappointed in our spouses. You know, we marry the, the person we marry, we have this idolized vision of them. You know what? We always are used to seeing them at their best. And, 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 and we want to imagine they're never going to be irritable. They're always going to, you know, pay attention. They're always going to be nice. You know what? And, and all of a sudden you get married and you realize it's not like that. He's irritable. She's irritable. He's gained weight. She's gained weight. She's not as patient and understanding as she appeared or he appeared to be. And we become very disillusioned and very disappointed in each other. And sometimes that leads us to be inconsiderate of one another. You know, you've married a, a human being. 
And human beings are not perfect. I, I know you thought you married a god or a goddess, you know. When you get married, oh, man, that's the man of my dreams, you know. Or look at the woman of my dreams. She's so beautiful. She's amazing. She's what God has for me. But as time goes by, you realize they're not a god or a goddess. They're human beings. All right? And then you begin to realize that, that marriages isn't just all sunshine and roses. But life is difficult. Marriage is difficult. Things are hard. And sometimes instead of being considerate and say, well, you know what, I got to deal with this and I got to understand and I got to work at this. We just sort of, you know what, this is not what I wanted. This is not what I signed up for. This is not what you pretended to be. In another message, I'll talk more to you about this. But listen to what Peter says. Peter writing to husbands in Peter chapter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, on the subject of consideration, he says this, husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding. Who's them? Giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. You know what Peter says? He says, husbands, show consideration to your wives. You know what? In your life together. And there's two reasons. Number one, they're the weaker vessel. It doesn't mean they're inferior than us, but God has wired them in a way where they deal with stuff a little different than us. They don't respond the way we respond to everything. And the second reason is so that your prayers are not hindered. Be, be considerate. In other words, sometimes you come to God in prayer, you say, Lord, there's this promotion up there, and you know what, I want it. Why don't you open the door that I get this promotion, or Lord, I'm, I'm dealing with this, and I'm dealing with that situation. And God turns to you and says, you know what, I'm glad you're talking to me, because I've been trying to get your attention. You know what, you're not treating your wife with consideration. And I'm not going to answer your prayers, God says, if you're not treating the weaker vessel, your mate, the one that I gave you. If you're not considerate, you know what, the prayers that you're asking for, they're like, they go. No, no, I want you to be considerate so that you, 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 your prayers are answered. And you know what happens? The truth of the matter is the longer we stay together married, the more inconsiderate we are to one another. Amen? Can you remember when you were dating, you were so considerate? No, 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 you first. No, 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 you first. Where do you want to go eat? No, 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 where do you want to go eat? The days, what do you want for dinner? No, whatever you want to make. You know, I just being with you, honey, that's all that matters. You know, you're very polite and you're very considerate. But once you get married, that stops. You know what? Bologna sandwiches every day. That's a, what's wrong with you? Don't you know how to cook? Amen. We stop being considerate. So how, how can we be more considerate of one another? Well, let me give you just real quick three, three practical ways. You know, one of the ways you show consideration is by being helpful. You know, consideration is seeing what your mate needs in advance and, and not having to wait for them to ask you. It's taking the initiative. It's, it's you doing something to help. That shows consideration. I was reading the story of a guy, you know what, who uh, goes to his doctor. And he tells his doctor, doctor, you know what, I'm not capable of doing all the things around the house that I used to. You know what, my wife's on me. So he goes through the examination, the examination is over, and he says, okay, doctor, tell me in plain English what's wrong with me. So the doctor says, okay, let me just break it down as simple as I can. You're a lazy bum, that's the problem. <laughs> the man nods and says, okay, now give me the medical term so I can tell my wife and make it sound like I got a problem. <laughs> Consideration, we'll talk more about that. The, the sympathy, the, another way that you can show consideration is you sympathize with her doubts and her fears. Hey guys, let me tell you something. Our wives deal with doubts and fears and insecurities more than what we deal with them. They, will, they deal with them all of the time. And sometimes it frustrates us. Sometimes it angers us. Why are you so negative? Why do you always see things that way? Why do you always, you know, uh, it's your insecurities that are talking. But listen to what Romans says, chapter 15, 1 and, one and 2. It says, we who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. In other words, Paul writes to this church. He says, hey, in your members, among your, your church, there are, there are Christians that have hang-ups and they have fears and they have doubts and they have some weird ideas. And you know what? They have all these issues and you need to be considerate of one another. And if that's good for a church, it's good for our marriages. Can I hear an amen to that? Some of your Bibles use the word bear one another. And the word bear means to carry, to support. It's the idea of carrying a load. And some guy says, ah, oh, but Pastor Vic, or some lady says, but he has so many hang-ups. She has so many hang-ups. They have so many fears, insecurities. There's so many doubts. I don't know what to do. Well, I'll tell you what God says. Be considerate. Be understanding of each other. 
You're going to get married, and when you got married, you married a human being that isn't perfect, that has issues, but so do you. And we have to be considerate of one another, and we have to be considerate of our doubts and our fears and our insecurities. Here's the third way you can show consideration. Forgiving one another. Forgiving your mistakes. Your mistakes. Listen, you're imperfect and you married an imperfect person. And because of that, it's impossible to have a perfect marriage. Listen, get out of your mind that you're going to have a perfect marriage. There are no perfect marriages. Because we're not perfect people, two imperfect people can never make a perfect marriage. So you know what marriages need because we're imperfect? We need masses, massive doses of forgiveness. We need to be able to forgive one another. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, the Bible says, Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. You know, forgiveness is vital. It's so important. It's one of the primary building blocks of our marriages. It's one of the ways that we show consideration. If your marriage or any, in any other relationship, you know what, if you've been having problems or it's been damaged because of anger, resentment, unfaithfulness, or any other sin, there's hope. You know what, there's forgiveness. God, God can forgive you, but God, the, the same forgiveness that he offers us, he says, I want you to give it to one another. Forgive one another. You know, you have to be able to forgive. Let me just tell you straight out, if you're in a marriage, if you're in a relationship, you're going to be offended, you're going to be hurt. You know what, your, your spouse, your partner is going to do stuff that, that bothers you. If you are not able to forgive them, you're never going to have a successful marriage. Forgive one another. And that's how you show consideration. Here's the third key. The third key is the ability to make decisions and settle arguments. The ability to make decisions and settle arguments, counselors call that compromise. You know, every marriage has conflict. You don't have to be married too long to, to realize that there are some things you're never going to agree on. You know what? Both of you have, have different perspectives of, of how to do life and how to live life. And you have different ideas about a lot of different things. So one of the things that we have to learn is to compromise. Meet in the middle. We've got to be flexible. Be willing to give up. Willing to yield your rights. And if you don't learn to compromise, you'll destroy your marriage. You'll destroy your relationships. Jesus said it this way in Mark chapter 3, verse 25. He said, a home divided against itself is doomed. A house divided cannot stand. You will destroy your home. It cannot stand. You know, the word stand means it can't continue safely. It won't stick around. It won't be, if it does, it won't be sound. It won't be healthy. And there's a lot of, one of the things that happens, there's a lot of couples in marriage, all of us, we have conflict. We have, we, we, we fight. By the way, there's nothing wrong with conflict. There's nothing wrong with fighting. The problem is, we feel we always have to win. Listen, when there's conflict, the goal isn't to win. The goal is to solve the problem, solve the conflict. So here's what it looks like. We're married and here's this problem. Here's me, here's my wife, here's this problem. And instead of attacking the problem, we start attacking each other. And the problem goes un unresolved. And at the end of the conversation, because we don't know how to compromise this, we start beating each other up. You know what? You know what the problem is? You're a jerk. You're an idiot. You're stupid. You don't get it. You don't care. You're irresponsible. Well, you know, your problem is you're emotional and you're a mess. And I don't know what, why I even married you. And before you know it, this thing, which is the problem, isn't even being resolved because you're, you want to win. And when you want to win, you start attacking each other. You know, one of the greatest truths I can teach you is, you know what? Conflict is fine. Resolve the problem. Don't try to win. You win when you resolve the problem. You lose when you win the argument. You might win that battle, but you're going to lose the war in your marriage. Proverbs 18, verse 1 and 2 says this. It says, unfriendly people care only about themselves, and they lash out at common sense. Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. So true. First of Corinthians 13, 5, the love chapter, it talks about the marks of love. And one of them is compromise when it says love does not demand its own way. Listen, in your relationships, you're not always going to get your way. And for some people, that's troublesome. I want my way. You know what I want to do? I want it my way. That's called selfishness. That's called immaturity. You know, have you, know, have you seen a little kid when you take something away? <sighs> you don't love me anymore. And, you know, you say, well, that's good. Actually, you laugh and it's sort of cute. And a two, three, four, five-year-old. But when you see that in a 20, 30, 40-year-old person, that's not that cute. <laughs> and yet it happens all the time. Why? I want my way. So let me give you an example in my marriage how I compromise. Very simple. My wife says jump, and I say, how high do you want me to jump, honey? And we're good. 
Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> You're going to have to learn how to compromise about a lot of stuff. About life, about your views about life, about money, about how you spend money, about where you spend the holidays, how you raise kids, how much time you're going to spend with the in-laws, about church, about religion. You're going to have to compromise about all of those things. And I'll tell you what happens when you learn to compromise, you're learning to be unselfish. You're learning to mature. It takes a mature person to say, you know, I don't always have to win. And it doesn't always have to be my way. When you insist on your way and your way only, you're not a compromiser. You know what? You're a dictator. You're a person who thinks you're in charge. And you marry someone who you wanted as a slave, whether it's the husband to the wife or the wife to the husband. And God never designed marriage to be that way or intended it to be that way. Key number four, physical contact. Physical contact. I'm talking about affection. You know, you must touch to keep in touch. You're not just a spirit. You're a body. God gave you skin and skin is to be touched. All of us need physical contact. As a matter of fact, doctors tell us that babies die from a lack of touch. They call it the failure to thrive syndrome. Isn't it amazing? Before we got married, we couldn't keep our hands off each other. Hugging and kissing, walking, holding arms and in, in hands. And, and once you get married, you stop touching one another. And you know what happens when you stop touching? Tenderness begins to go away. Because the way we uh, uh, demonstrate and show uh, affection is through our touching. And when that happens, the devil comes in. And the devil says, good, they're not touching. They're not having sex. You know what? She's withholding sex from him. He is too busy. He doesn't care about sex. And you know what? They're mad that they're not even talking. They're not touching. And the devil, the devil says, good. And you know what the devil does? He begins to put in our minds, well, then I got to look somewhere else. I'm going to talk to you in the last sermon about why people have affairs. And it's more than just physical stuff. There's other reasons, but that's one of the main reasons. But I want you to know physical touch is important. And the devil, he wants you not to touch each other because he wants to set you up for failure. Now, people say to me, well, Pastor Vic, I'm just not affectionate. You know, and, and, and there could be a lot of reasons for that. Maybe you didn't learn it in, in your home of origin. Maybe sometimes we're just too tired. Maybe sometimes we're just too busy. Sometimes it's health issues. Maybe I, I'm, I'm mad. I got unresolved issues. I, I got resentment. I got bitterness toward my spouse. And there could be dozens of reasons that you're not interested. But listen, you're hurting your marriage when there's not physical contact. You are affecting your relationship. Listen to what God says. By the way, God has a lot to say about this. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3. It says this, The husband should not deprive his wife of sexual intimacy, which is her right as a married woman. Nor should the wife deprive her husband. Now, I want you to think about when these verses were, were written, 40, 35, 40 years after Christ. By the way, these verses are remarkable. They, they reveal a viewpoint that was far ahead of its time in the area of intimate relationships. And yet God tells Paul, I want you to write about that. And I want you to write about it because this is important. Because sex and touching has profound implications on our marriages. In fact, God says, God gave sex to cement marriages. The primary purpose of sex is not to have children. The primary purpose of sex is to cement a husband and a wife together in a spiritual union and a bonding that will take place that is exclusive to them and no one else. And because of that, God says, that's why you shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. Because when you have sex outside of marriage, you are bonding with that person. You are, you are connecting with that person. You will never forget that person. That person will never forget you. Paul later on writes to the Corinthians in 1st of Corinthians chapter 6 verse 16. He says, do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. In other words, God says, Paul says, there's more to sex than just mere sex, skin to sin. Sex is a, a spiritual mystery. Something spiritual happens to people when they have sex. And God has designed it. So that you can have an intimate, a physical intimacy that from that flows out all kinds of other intimacies. There's a spiritual connection. Listen, ladies, listen, guys. It's not just about having your physical needs met. There's a spiritual connection to our sex, our sex drive and when we have sex with our spouse. Now I'm going to stop there. And uh, the last sermon, I'll sort of, it'll stay, it'll stay PG. You don't have to worry. But, but uh, I'm going to talk to you about that. The last sermon of the series. But here's key number five. 
Key number five is a deep lasting commitment to each other in spite of the circumstances and the situations you face. In other words, you're committed to hanging in there and making your marriage work. You're going to fight for your marriage. You don't run away. That's called commitment. You know, the one word that best summarizes a, a good relationship isn't the word love, as important as love is. You know what that word is? It's commitment. You know, the difference between marriage and just living together is commitment. You know people that live together outside of marriage? You know why they do that? Because technically in their mind, I'm not committed to this. I can walk away whenever I want. I don't know why you would want to be in a relationship where you're living with somebody where that person doesn't want to marry you. Because you know what they're telling you? I'm not committed to you. I'm committed to you as long as you behave and you do what I want. And the day you don't do what I want, I'm out of here. Why you would settle for that blows my mind. And yet a lot of people settle for that. There's no commitment. And not only that, you know, there's a lot of people today that are not committed to their marriage. You know, the first problem, I'm going to run. There's, a, there's an escape hatch. There's an exit sign. You know, it doesn't work out. I'm out of here. And a lot of people are, are running away. You know, God expects us to keep our commitments. Malachi chapter 2, verse Notice what it says. This is God speaking. I hate divorce, says the Lord. So make sure you don't break your promise to be faithful to your mate. Yet today, divorce is a reality. reality. We live in a world where even though God's ideal is that we be together till, li- till the end of life, d- divorce is a big reality. And by the way, divorce is not the unpardonable sin. But let me tell you something. You will never build a strong, intimate marriage relationship where divorce is always an option. Where every time there's a problem, you talk about running. You talk about getting away. You know, we live in a culture that is so easy to run away, to quit. To say, you know what, I don't want to be married. In California, we call it no-fault divorce. You know what no-fault divorce is? You don't need a reason to get a divorce. And if you do need one, let us give you one. Irreconcilable differences. You know what, I don't like the way she cooks, so I don't want her anymore. That's an irreconcilable difference. She doesn't satisfy my tummy. Amen, I'm out of here. But you're never going to build a strong marriage, you know what, as long as there's no commitment. You know what commitment says? Commitment says, I will fight for my marriage. You know, I will do all that it is necessary to keep my marriage alive. Let me say this, and I want you to listen to this. I want you to get this. Somewhere along in your marriage journey, your commitment's going to require you to be unsatisfied, unhappy for a season. Because it doesn't always work out the way you want. And there are some things you have no control over, neither does your spouse. And there are times where you willingly have to say, this is a difficult season, but I'm not going to run. I'm going to hang in there. There's a lot of people out there who have this attitude. No, no, the moment it gets rough, I'm out. They're always looking over the the fence. You know what? The grass is greener over there. My grass is dried up. I'm going to go to the greener grass. And you know, you know what happens? Once you get there, it dries up again because what you did here that caused this one to dry is going to cause that one to get dry and you're always going to be looking. You know where the grass is greener? It's where you fertilize it and you water it and you commit to it. That's where the grass is greener. You know what God says? I want you to commit to your relationship, to your marriage. Don't run. Get that out of your vocabulary. You know, we're going to be married 43 years in November. We got married when we were 12. I know that was way young and <laughs> against the law, but we did. But you know, in those early years, if I can be honest with you, I was clueless about how to be a good husband. And in some ways, I still am. i gotten a lot better. Amen, amen. <laughs> a lot, sister, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, all during our difficult times, and we've had them, she's never threatened to divorce me. She's never thrown divorce as an option. Why? Because we made a commitment, a serious commitment to God and to each other that we would work out. We didn't have any idea what the issues would be or how difficult they would be, but we made a commitment that we would work out the issues regardless of what they were. Whatever came up, we were together, we were a team, and we were going to do it together. But you know what happens today? It's so easy to talk about divorce when you're feeling hurt and pain. You know why? You want the spouse that caused it to feel what you're feeling. And during the the, the battle, the heat of the battle, we say some terrible things. Well, I'm going to divorce you. And I'm not going to let you see the kids. Well, that's fine. I'm not going to give you child support. I'll quit my job if I have to. You know what? I'll take him and we'll go to Mexico or wherever where you cannot find us. And you know what? I'm going to do everything. I'm going to put on Facebook everything you are. And we start talking all this madness. 
because we're hurt. And you know, quitting your marriage is a choice. And people who quit, you know, choose to break their marriage, they're, they're breaking a vow that they made to God. You didn't just make a, God, a vow to your spouse, you made it before the Lord. And what I'm asking you to do is take divorce off the table as a threat. It can't be an option. I'll tell you why. Because when divorce is an option, you put all your energies in figuring out how to get out of my marriage. You know what? All my money, all my energy. Once you take that off the table, now all your energy is going to be on how can I make it work? What do I have to do to be successful? Shift your negative energy to trying to figure out how to get out to how can I really invest and make my marriage work? Listen, you're never going to fix your marriage if you continue to harbor the possibility of divorce in the back of your head. It's not an option. But, but you say, well, everybody's telling me. I know everybody's telling you because that's what everybody's doing. Dump the bomb. Get rid of the witch. You know, you, you, you can do better than that. <laughs> you know, this conversation we're having today, you're not going to hear it out there. You're only going to hear it in church. And some people say, well, it's because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's outdated. It's antiquated. It's not relevant. It's very relevant today. You know why God hates divorce? Because he knows the pain and the anguish and the hurt and the destruction he, he doesn't say, don't get divorced because he wants to rob you of fun and he wants you to be miserable. No, he, he knows how hard it is on families. Listen, put your effort in making a, a good marriage. Yeah, it takes communication. It takes consideration. It takes compromise. It takes physical contact. It takes contact. But here's the uh, commitment. But here's the most important one. And I'm going to be ending. It takes Jesus Christ. It takes God. Number six, key number six is a common spiritual foundation and a goal, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that God never meant for you to go through your marriage just with the two of you working on it? Jesus wants to be the center of it. Jesus Christ is the key, by the way, that opens all the other keys. All the other keys happen easier and better when Jesus is the center. You know, in California, we're known as earthquake country. And when they build homes, they, bring, they build good foundations because foundations that are not well, when the, when the hurricanes, when, when, the, when the earthquakes come, you know what? It'll crumble. Everybody knows that. It's the same thing in your relationship. You need a good foundation, Jesus Christ. And there will be earthquakes. There will be winds. There will be trials that will assault your marriage. Health, financial, infidelity, emotion, ah, all kinds of different problems and stresses. But when you have a solid foundation, you're not going to crumble. Yeah, you'll, you'll hear it. You'll feel it. You'll, you'll experience some of the roof fall off, but your house will stand. Isaiah 33, 6 says, He will be the sure foundation for your times. A rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. In other words, over and over, Old Testament, New Testament, just says Jesus is the foundation. And when he's the foundation, one of the things that characterizes him being the foundation is we have the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? We have respect. We respect God for who he is. And we listen to what he says. And we build our marriages around him and his word. You know, when we take our focus off ourselves and we put it on Jesus, that causes us to be more accepting, more understanding, more loving more forgiving of each other. There's nothing better than Jesus. You know that question, what would Jesus want me to do is so important. The best thing you can do for your marriage is open your heart and say, I'll tell the Lord, Lord, I want you to be the center of my marriage. God, I want to be a godly man. I want to be a godly woman. And how do you do that? Very simple. First of all, you open your life to Jesus Christ. You say, Lord, here's my life. I need you. Open your, open your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's number two. You commit your life and your marriage to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's number three. You get involved in a life group. In a, in a group of support of people that can help you. Stop talking to those toxic, negative people that are giving you bad advice. Get into a life group where they're praying, teaching you God's word, loving you, modeling what a good marriage is like. Where you can ask questions of people that know what they're talking about. Not of people that don't know what they're talking about. You know, a place where you can read your Bible and pray. And by the way, and you can learn, what does this mean? And, and what is God asking of me? And you're going to realize how your marriages will flourish. I challenge you, commit your life to Christ. Commit your marriages. You know what? Commit to follow the Lord. Because good marriages just don't happen. We need all the help we can get. Let me end by telling you this. And worship team, would you come up at this time? You know what, of all the things that I've done in my life, I've done a lot of things, but the most challenging thing in my life has been my marriage. You know, the hardest thing that I've done in my life is get married. Not because my wife is a bad, she's a wonderful person. 
I got a, we, got, we have a wonderful marriage. We have great kids. We have great, 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 great grandkids. But you know why it's hard? Because I can't, I can't take a break. I got to be on it. And sometimes, honestly, I get these weird thoughts that scare me. And so do you. And sometimes, if I'm not close to the Lord, I realize I'm capable of doing some really dumb stuff. And I don't want to. Because 43 years ago, I committed that I wouldn't. In many areas. And I'm not just talking about one. I'm talking about so many areas of marriage. And what I've learned is that what I do, what I put into marriage is what I get out of it. What I invest, that's what comes back. I want to say to you that today could be a fresh start. Some of you are here and you say, Pastor Vic, I'd like to work on some of the things you talked about. But Pastor Vic, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of issues. And you, you talked about a lot of them today. And we've tried and nothing has happened. But why don't you invite Jesus? Why don't you open your heart to the Lord? Why don't you turn to Him? You give Him your life. You give Him your marriage. Get into God's Word. Get with somebody that can help you. I want to pray for you. As a matter of fact, if you're by your spouse and you say, Pastor, pray for us, would you get their hand, squeeze their hand, and I want to say a prayer. And, and after I pray, uh, they're going to come up and they've got some presentations to do. And we need to be out by 12 because they're cutting the light at 12 o'clock. I'm serious. All the lights are going to be out in the neighborhood. Have you noticed some of the, the lights are already out? On the, and they gave us till 12. I hope they let us keep their promise to 12. But hold their hand. And I want to pray for you right now. Squeeze it. And you pray in your heart. And you talk to the Lord. Something like this. Lord, help us to learn, Father, to have a successful marriage. Lord, today we talked about communication. Help us to do that better. Lord, to be considerate of each other. Lord, we, we're not doing very well there. Lord, to compromise in areas of disagreement and to forgive each other. And Lord, the physical contact and affection that has suffered because of resentment and bitterness. And Lord, hard feelings that we have. And Father, sometimes I, I feel there is no commitment and, and we do throw divorce around like it's an easy, simple, simplistic idea and term when we understand the gravity of it. And most importantly, we, we have tried to do it on our own. Come into our lives, come into our marriages. Jesus Christ, we need you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you say a good amen to that?